Okay, welcome everybody. So, um, I'm Michael Owens and I'm chairing the debate today. Uh, what will happen to immigration after Brexit? The issue, as we know, has got many dimensions and I hope we can explore some of them today. So, the change in dynamics of immigration, you know, what's its character, what are the pushes and pulls that uh, influence and affect immigration? Do we understand immigration in its own terms properly? Questions like the, you know, the, I mean, the crucial question clearly given by Brexit, the, the control over borders, what is its significance? You know, is control over borders important and if so, why? Um, given that we uh, get it, if Brexit goes ahead, then what shall we do with this? It's clearly uh, an important dimension to the immigration question. Questions of public attitudes towards immigration. Clearly, there's a world of interpretation of the Brexit vote in relation to public attitudes. Um, how, has the, uh, how has the Brexit vote influenced public attitudes towards immigration? And indeed, how will public, uh, public attitudes shape what happens with immigration uh, afterwards? So those and many more questions. Um, and really keen to engage all of you in the conversation. I'm going to ask the, our panellists to speak for five minutes each uh, by way of introduction and then I'll ask you to contribute as soon as I possibly can. So um, in the order that people are going to contribute, so first of all Dr Jim Butcher on the far left. He's a reader in geography at Canterbury Christchurch University and the co-author of Volunteer Tourism Lifestyle politics uh, in an age of, in of international development. Yeah, that's close enough. Near enough. Near enough. Jim will tell all. Uh, then on my immediate left, Alp Mehmet, who is the chairman of Migration Watch UK and the author of much of that organisation's work that you can find online. On my immediate right, Madeline Sumption, who's the director of the Migration Observatory at the University of Oxford. And then finally, uh, on my far right, Patrick Vernon, OBE, social commentator, and importantly, the, founda the founder of 100 Great Black Britons, uh, a, 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 a seminal intervention uh, into the, the whole uh, kind of uh, the, the perception and the, and the kind of uh, relationship of, of, of British society to uh, black Britons. Uh, I think that you wrote that in 2003, Patrick, That's or you launched it in 2003. So uh, those are the panellists. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'll ask them to contribute, and I'll give you a hint when you're, when you're getting near to the end of your five minutes. A minute, yeah? Yeah, a minute before. Jim. All right, thanks, Michael. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming along. Um, my main contention is, is that the main issue around immigration policy post-Brexit isn't the policy per se, but the question really is whose policy is it after Brexit? And I think that's the question fundamentally that Brexit poses uh, uh, to all of us. Contrary to uh, the way that the, issue, the, issue, the issues are sometimes discussed, the Brexit vote itself to leave the European Union said nothing whatsoever about immigration. It said nothing whatsoever and continues to say nothing whatsoever substantially about workers' rights, financial liberalisation, privatisation or anything else. What it does is it, it potentially at least presents these as questions for public debate within Brit Britain for British voters to vote on and decide on in, 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 in the future. And therefore, again, contrary to belief in some circles, Brexit there is very little for people who favour a more liberal immigration uh, uh, approach. There's very little for those people to, to worry about, and there's a lot to argue for uh, and a lot to win uh, as, as well. Uh, one of the frustrating things, I think, about the discussion about immigration in the, in, in, in the light of Brexit is this argument about, was it sovereignty or was it immigration? And this has been played about, different statistics have been brought into play, which I don't really want to go into. But I do want to say that I think it's a false debate, substantially. Because at the end of the day, if you want sovereignty, if you want to take back control, if you want more control over your life through politics, what exactly are we talking about? Well, you're talking about things like immigration, as well as trade policy and everything else. So, so the discussion about sovereignty and immigration 
are one and the same debate substantially most of the time. I think, it, personally, it's a very big shame that um, uh, in the context of the 2016 referendum, that very, very few people, one or two people did, but very, very few people argued for Brexit on the basis of arguing for the potential to argue for a more liberal immigration policy. Uh, it seems to me that many people, many liberal people who want a more liberal policy, who have very genuine concerns about the treatment of asylum seekers, for example, and the situation around um, uh, immigration generally, have tended to look away from the British public, the voting public, and much more towards the European Union. I think that's a quite a long-standing process that stems from the 1980s and the defeats uh, that the Labour Party suffered at the hands of Margaret Thatcher over a period of time. It was a general tendency for people on the left and Liberals to look to global institutions to oversee immigration in a more liberal way. They kind of lost faith a little bit with the, uh, the British electorate, really, to put it uh, uh, bluntly. Others looked to NGOs and campaigns, again, often very, very worthy, but not accountable to voters, accountable to their supporters, um, and, 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 and so on. So I think that's kind of um, foregrounds some of the lack of debate, uh, substantial debate over immigration uh, post, post Brexit. People have lost faith in the masses, the voters if you like, to uh, be anything other than irredeemably racist or xenophobic and certainly there's been a lot of labelling in the aftermath of the vote. Others on the kind of more radical side of arguing for liberal immigration have, have held up the banner of no borders. And I have a problem with that, although I think, uh, you know, I have some sympathies with that, but I have a problem with that. And one of, the, I'm going to give you a little anecdote just to explain perhaps more clearly about that. In uh, Canterbury, where, where I live, a number of friends and people I know um, take their No Borders banner over to Calais, where we've had the so-called jungle, where asylum seekers have been trying to, you know, have, have been there uh, under very, very uh, bad conditions. Um, one thing, I do a little bit of mentoring of young asylum seekers who have made it to the UK, and I can tell you the one thing they want desperately is citizenship, is sovereign citizenship of Britain within borders. Britain has borders. And it seems to be a contradiction there on the one hand between the moral argument for no borders uh, for a kind of global world and it's all the rest of it, and on the other hand, uh, the desperate need for people who have no place from which to speak to actually be citizens of a country, to be able to play a full role as citizens and develop their lives uh, in, in, in that way. A minute, Jim. Only a minute? Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that uh, in the aftermath of Brexit, this lack of debate about immigration has only been accent accentuated. If you ever saw the TV programme, the young ones in the 80s, where Rick and Viv would shout fascist at everyone, it's almost been a rerun of that, only with much more serious consequences, I think. Uh, in terms of labelling the large majority of, of people in, in, in Britain. The real problem with the, with the debate in that respect, another real problem with the debate is the fact that free movement, as people have been championing on one side around the Brexit issue, the corollary of that has been the closure of movement between people from Europe and outside of Euro Europe. Many examples of that, the 2010 cap put on non-EU migration at a time when EU migration is, is, is encouraged and proceeding in Tony Blair's 2002 National Immigration Act, another example of that. So I'm going to cut through all of the substance that I wanted to say. Good, but because that's fair enough. Got about 10 seconds. 10 seconds, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd really like to see a more optimistic and more liberal policy, a more forward-thinking policy. But the key thing is it has to be a policy that voters feel that they own. People do have economic and cultural concerns and anxieties, and it's no use ignoring them. We have to confront those face on and make that, you know, and involve people in their policy for immigration in their own country. Thank you very much, Jim. Okay, um, Alp, your, your opportunity to introduce. Thanks very much, Mick. <clears throat> now then, um, firstly, can we separate asylum and immigration? I'm simply going to be talking about immigration, um, two very different aspects of people moving to another country. What will happen to immigration after Brexit was the exam question that we were set. My initial reaction was, if only we knew. God only knows. 
It depends on so much. Will there be a Brexit? Who will form the next government? Will it be a party with an overall majority or a minority? Would it be a, a coalition? Who will be in that coalition? Let's assume that Brexit is going to happen. What happens after that? The trade deals that we're told we're going to have to um, enter into, what will those trade deals, um, what will be in those trade deals? Will those trade deals be with the EU? Will it be with the, the rest of the world? Will they differ depending on who it is with? If Labour wins and governs on its own, we know that there will be a, a renegotiation <coughs> with a customs union. And as John McDonald said the other day, pretty close to uh, the single market. Therefore, as far as possible, free movement. All this is going to have an effect on the sort of system we have and what it means to the flows if Labour is in with the SNP, Scotland will almost certainly have its own immigration system. What will the other regions say? What will London say? Will they not want it as well? If the Tories win, again, will they be with the DUP again? The DUP don't want this uh, deal that Boris has struck up. Well. If so, are we going to have a deal even under the, the Tories if they're not in the majority? They have said, and we're told, and Madeline will tell us a lot more about it because she's a member of the MAC, the Migration Advisory Committee. They've asked the Migration Advisory Committee to look an, at a, an Australian type points based system. What does that mean? What will the Migration Advisory Committee recommend? Having said that, the last time they made recommendations, the government didn't necessarily uh, accept all of them. Will the recommendations from the MAC, will the bits that we take from a points-based system, Australian or another one, Austrian, New Zealand, Canadian points-based system, they all have them. What will we import from those systems? The Australians, for example, have an overall cap on the numbers um, going to Australia to settle. And two thirds of that cap is um, for employment. Will there be a, th a salary threshold as the Migration Advisory Com Committee uh, advised in their last report? Will there be a labour market test? Will we be looking to see what we lack, what we need, um, before we put in place our own system? A minute there. All these imponderables. And frankly, at this stage, I, I genuinely think it's absolutely impossible to say what system we're going to be ending up with. One point that I'd like to um, make and underline, the latest ONS figures um, with regard to annual net migration um, suggested, projected that we will have a population of 70 million by the year 2028. What that means is another three and a half million people for whom we've got to find housing, schools, and services of one form or another. When I spoke last time in this sort of forum, seven, six years ago, there were something like two million people fewer in the country. And I said that the population would increase, and I was told, nonsense, it won't. Well, it has. But then, six years ago, who would have said that the inspiration behind this particular occasion would have been uh, representing um, the Brexit party in the European Parliament? Um, to wind up now. And, uh, yes, that probably would wind her up if I said it to her. 
lots more to discuss. Good. Thank you very much, Al. Madeleine, your thoughts, please. Thanks. Um, so I thought I'd just uh, make a, a couple of different points to kick off the discussion, uh, looking particularly at the um, economics of migration and how we use economic arguments in the kind of broader um, policy and, and political debate. Um, so the, the first point I want to make is that there is no objective answer to the question how much immigration the UK needs. So you hear assertions on either side of the debate uh, ranging from, say, you know, construction in London can't survive without free movement, or on the other side, um, the the population of the UK is already too high. And um, in both these cases, I would say these are subjective ju judgments. Um, they can't be empirical facts. And this is because the discipline of, of economics and all the research that's been done, it can identify broad positives and negatives in different domains that result from different kinds of immigration. But it can't really tell us precisely what to do. Um, it, for example, it can't tell us whether, say, the um, productivity benefits of greater population density outweigh um, our desire to preserve green spaces and not have to build so much housing. It can't tell us whether we ought to be willing to spend a lot more on social care or whether we should support that system by relying on uh, very low-wage migrant workers. These are fundamentally political questions, I think, not, uh, not so much economic ones, even if they're informed by, by economics. What economics does tell us, I think, in general, is that a lot of the economic impacts of, of migration um, are, appear on average actually to be smaller than a lot of people expect, um, especially when we're looking at migration into to lower wage jobs. And people, different people interpret that in different ways. My reading actually is that um, in some ways it means that policymakers do have some latitude to introduce immigration policies that reflect non-economic concerns. Um, so not just, you know, what's good for the economy, but what kind of society do we want to be? And that, again, is something, obviously, that where different people will have, will have different views. The second point I want to make is that um, I think while immigration is inevitable to some extent, there will always be some immigration, the, um, the level and the type of, of immigration that we have is, is not. Now, some people argue that migration essentially can't be reduced, that the economy is too reliant on the levels of migration that we have, that politicians are too constrained to change it. And I think there are some elements of truth um, in, in those arguments. So, for example, you couldn't, it would be very difficult to imagine a government simply banning family migration, for example, saying, you know, you can't bring a foreigner to the country if you, if you want to marry them. Um, but um, I do think that, that a policy does matter. It is feasible to end free movement if the UK wants to. I agree with Alp on the huge uncertainty about what is actually going to happen, so I'm not going to attempt um, uh, to, make, to make predictions. Um, but I, I think we say you know, many countries don't have free movement, and I don't see evidence that it would be a, an economic catastrophe to get rid of it. Uh, my central expectation is that if some of the kinds of restrictions that have been discussed um, go ahead, then immigration will fall, or possibly not quite as much as, as some people expect. Um, and then the, the final point I'd like to make is, and I think this is actually really important when thinking through the debate and kind of normative questions about what we should do, is that immigration is not a monolithic thing. Um, people come to the UK and they're admitted to the UK for um, a whole host of different reasons. You have family members, refugees, international students, uh, people coming in uh, to work in a, a whole host of different jobs. And it's quite hard to have a meaningful debate about um, what we should do on immigration policy unless those, those different reasons and routes for coming are considered um, separately. So, for example, the, both the economic implications and the ethical implications of, say, um, not admitting someone's partner and therefore dividing a family are very different from the implications of not admitting a young single worker. And if you lump everyone together and just kind of call it immigration and talk about having more or less, I think you lose a lot of the, um, the, the important nuance that we actually need to decide what kind of um, immigration policy um, we want as a society. Thank you very much, Madeleine. Uh, okay, so Patrick, your thoughts, please. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Hopefully still awake. Um, just. Uh, some context before I um, go into why we need to look, look at immigration differently. Um, so after the EU referendum in 2016, two things happened. Um, a close friend of mine, um, Sam King, um, who served in the Second World War from Jamaica, who was part of the Windows generation, was actually on the Empire Windows ship, passed away at the age of 90 years old. And also um, there was a massive increase in hate crime targeting 
not just people of colour, but also Polish community as well, as a result of the aftermath of EU uh, vote. So one of the things that you can, what's quite clear what post-Brexit is there's still going to be a degree of hostility against people of colour and anyone who is seen as, in inverted commas, not British. Last night I was at, um, I was in Wolverhampton, the place I was born. Uh, I was at my parents' 60th wedding anniversary. They came to Britain in, in the 50s as part of that, that migration journey, that migration story. And it was fantastic to have four, three and a half generations of us and all of us, I mean, in terms of myself, uh, my sisters, their children, my, and the, my parents, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, three and a half generations of us, we see ourselves as British. But each time you go anywhere, you are asked, where are you from? And you say, I was born in Wolverhampton. No, where are you from? No, really, where, where are you really from? And this question is still there. It's no different to when Margaret Thatcher talked about Britain being swamped in the 1970s, no different to when Norman Tewitt used his cricket test, um, and it's no different to when Tony Blair talked about Cool Britannia. The question that it raises around immigration is who's British and who's not? And this is one of the reasons why I did my campaign some years ago called Great Black Britons. And more recently I was involved in a big campaign for the last decade around the whole idea of celebrating Windrush Day. Because in a nutshell, in Britain we do not celebrate migration. Migration is still seen as a negative connotation. And yet if you look at all the data produced by um, uh, CBI, the Institute of Economics, um, and a whole range of organisations, and including the Migration Observatory, they demonstrate there is a clear economic case for migration. And yet, for some reason, in terms of Brexit, the, the debate seems to be measured on the issue of we want our country back and sovereignty, uh, which in many ways is the issue of racism, discrimination and legacy of empire, which is still pervading the country and still is influencing the whole debate around Brexit. And therefore, if you're looking at the whole debate around immigration, we need immigration. We've always, my parents came here in the 50s. People come from the EU of late, and we still need, we still need migration and, and immigration particularly, because there's a clear issue that there is still need for labour. If we look internationally, Britain is the fifth um, most, inverted commas, successful global economy in the world. 80% um, of the population, 80% of the landmass of Britain is unoccupied, but we're still thinking that migrants are going to take over the country and there'll be no space to do anything. If you look at what's happened globally, over 60 million people have been displaced over the last decade through uh, climate change, um, um, kind of um, foreign policy interventions, uh, etc. Yet majority of people who are displaced are still displaced, are, are, are in uh, countries in Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and only a trickle only comes to UK, but yet we're given the impression that we've got this massive um, increase of migration, yet over the last few years there's actually been a net uh, migration decrease, basically, because of the hostile immigration policy, which in many ways is another lesson for the future we can look at. So we have an immigration system which is racist, uh, sexist and homophobic, and we need to challenge, challenge, challenge that immigration system, because what's quite clear from my campaigning work around the Windrush scandal is that the hostile environment policy and the immigration policy of the Home Office, and, that's been, and that has been an issue for all political parties to be out of interest, has worked on the, on the premise of fear and intimidation, almost like equivalent to the Mafia, which is fear that we don't want you here, fear that if you, um, we will make sure that you can't access um, a whole range of state benefits by the fact that you've actually made a financial contribution through work as well. And if we're looking forward, we're the, we don't know who's going to be in power come December the 12th. Minute, but what is very clear is that the immigration system's broken. There's over one million people in Britain who are living in the shadows. Their states need to be regularised. Why is it that um, the current immigration policy has certain visa restrictions? So the best example I can give you is um, I was in Jamaica a couple of years ago and I met the chair of the Royal Legion in Jamaica and he said to me, I, you know, I fought in the Second World War. I have to apply for a visa to come to Britain to visit family. 
that tells you how unjust the system is. And the point around family stuff is important. Current immigration policy does discriminate against families. It does not recognise family connections as well. And I think more work needs to be done on that. So whoever is in power, we need the system's broken and we need to have a fair system. And why not have open borders? Because that's the way of globalisation in terms of how we consume co uh, products and services. People are part of that process as well. OK, thanks very much. Can we thank the panel? OK, uh, over to you. Uh, I'd like to start off with questions, please, in, in the first instance. But um, So anything at all, uh, and then I'll ask the panel to respond when we've got something going. So, yeah, there's a gentleman in the middle with the, have the microphone here, and then afterwards the, the lady behind him. Then I'll come over to this side. <clears throat> yeah, um, thank you all very much. Um, I worked when I was in Customs and Excise um, on the report on how the UK should handle uh, the expansion of the EU. Um, and w we reported against what uh, the Home Office put, that there would be a big increase in migration for a number of reasons. And therefore, it's fair to say we're not, we weren't and aren't admirers of the Home Office. And I, I can understand people's concerns about the efficiency of the system. My question is, um, what specific measures do you think should be taken to improve the top-down and bottom-up information to decision-makers? And is it time for the Home Office to be overseen by um, a Minister for Internal Affairs with his or her own staff to bring it together? Because it isn't fit for purpose, as of course one former minister said about it. Thank you very much indeed. And then there's a, a lady but three rows behind. Okay, I am going to make a comment, but the question yeah, would be what you think about my comment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, firstly, I very much agree that the, at the moment there is a hostile environment for migrants. There's no question about it. There's lots of immigration acts which makes it very, very difficult for migrants to live here, uh, move freely, work without any uh, intimidation. However, where I disagree quite a lot with what Patrick said is that it's taking back sovereignty for me and immigration, you know, taking back sovereignty is about taking back control. So taking back control of our own country, of our own uh, laws, we decide uh, what sort of working conditions people in this country should have, not the European uh, Union. We decide what kind of immigration we should have. And that doesn't mean closing off avenue to people coming in. You can still have control of your country and decide of certain laws, liberal immigration laws. The key point here is you don't decide from up there and think that you've got everybody behind you. The key point that's been missing is that we've allowed control to the European Union and our politicians have not even been able to argue with us and win support for what they want to do. So yes, we want sovereignty, we can have a liberal uh, immigration policy, and the key point here is to go out there, argue, have a public debate, take a stand why you want a less, uh, you know, a, a liberal policy, argue for okay. it and win support. Thank you. Okay, so from the people at the back there, can I see the hands at the, on, on, on the left, on my left side of the room? Who wanted to speak over here? There were some hands. Okay, down the, the further down here, the lady in the middle. Thank you. Um, I think the way I would probably ask the question is the flip side of what you're talking about in terms of policy, because I think a, a couple of you were talking about numbers and how do you get that the balance right for the, the um, electorate and the public to accept. I'd probably put it a different way around, and I'd say, what is your view of a citizen 
who is in this country, what does that mean from the point of view of what does it mean in terms of obligations and rights? Um, so, for example, for me, I think if you are coming to settle in Britain and you are paying taxes and you are here and you want the National Health Service, then yes. If you're my brother who lives in America and wants to vote in the elections and he hasn't been here for decades, well, why should he have a vote? So, just because he was born here. So, I'm saying... For me, I just wonder whether there's a discussion that we need to have where the electorates, not policy makers, but the electorate part of this discussion, which is what does it mean to be a British citizen? What does it mean to play a part in the country that you're in, whether you're born here or you arrive here? And there's expectations that have changed dramatically. One example, Heiston Green in Nottingham, where I live, um, I, there's always been an area of uh, students, of immigrants, of white people. Expectations of walking into shops where you can and can't go was very much an open place. Now it's uh, much more closed. The signage in foreign languages, you don't necessarily feel welcome to necessarily go into every shop. There isn't an expectation of assimilation. Something has therefore changed in what we to and how quick. we integrate. So I think for me, there's lots of different levels to this about what it means to be a citizen. I think the public is up for it. I think the post-Windrush reaction from the public of wanting fairness compared to Rudd and May's hostile environments, which was disgusting, I think the public's up for that discussion. And I think we need a good faith debate that allows anything, because people are not going to put their point across in um, the most savoury of terms often and I think we need to give people a bit of a free pass at the moment. Okay thank you. Um, I'll take one more and then I'll ask the panel to to respond then I'll come back to more people yeah. Um, thank you. I'll just make two quick points. Um, what Try and make a question as well. Yeah. Well, do, okay, do you agree with the following? Yeah. Um, <laughs> You've given I'm everyone really, a get-out card there, you as, know? Uh, yeah, well, that's, I'm an academic, what can I Go say? On. Be uh, quick, though, yeah? As a social scientist, I really feel constrained to respond to what Patrick said about the, the environment post-Brexit. And I think it goes to read Jim's points about what the immigration issue meant in the context of Brexit, because it's true that reported hate crime has gone up, but that's been very much spurred by campaigners encouraging reporting. And the fact that we have a hate crime reporting system that anybody who says, I've seen a hate crime, it's just recorded. It's never disputed, there's no criteria. There's a whole host of evidence to the contrary. The, the annual crime survey shows that the experience of hate crime has fallen a third, from 2007-8 to 2017-18. There's been no increase at all in successful hate crime prosecutions. Attitudes to immigration measured in the British Social Attitudes Survey have been improving continuously since 2011. Attitudes, um, when people are asked to me what is important when selecting immigrants to come to the country, um, ethnicity has been steadily falling as a criterion, is very low anyway. Concern about um, skills that benefit the economy is much more significant. In the World Values Survey, the UK is continuously among the most positive, liberal, um, progressive in the world. That's also shown in Eurobarometer run by the U uh, EU Commission, showing that the UK has the most um, positive um, tolerant attitude to people from different ethnicities and different countries in the world. We need to put this into perspective. Yes, there, are, there is a small minority of um, hostile racists who have no doubt been emboldened by the Brexit vote, but these, all of these different data sources show that the majority of people in this country don't hold those values. So what does it mean for the Brexit vote that immigration was a big spur towards leaving? It has to do with control. It has to do with the sense that we have lost control of this part of our policy set and a desire for immigration to be managed, controlled in all the supporting services, housing, etc. around that. The second point, and I'll be quicker on this one, is it really true to say we don't know what will come, as Alp suggested? It seems to me the current British growth model relies very heavily on domestic consumption and therefore population growth and on expansion in low wage, low productivity service economy requiring large supply of labour. So unless we rethink the British growth model, and I don't really see any party having the appetite for major structural economic reforms, the economy will continue to quote-unquote require large-scale immigration, which would seem to embed a kind of liberal immigration policy afterwards. 
um, which could be quite di difficult for sort of re-engaging and re-democratising immigration policy. OK, Thank thanks you. very much. So I I've seen a number of other people that want to speak. I just want to ask the panel to, you don't have to respond to everything, but anything that you'd like to respond to so far? Starting with you, Patrick. Sure, yeah. Um, where do I start? Um, just the whole stuff around sovereignty is quite interesting, the conversation. The impression that it's given that Britain has lost its sovereignty because we're members of the EU. And when we were desperate to be part of the EU, you know, about 40 plus years ago. And, you know, Britain, in terms of sovereignty, has not lost its sovereignty. Uh, you know, because we still make our laws, we still have a parliament, even though it's slightly dysfunctional at times. Um, and actually, if you look at the impact of immigration policy, it's had a bigger impact on people of colour who are part of the Commonwealth than the EU. If you look at the, 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 uh, the visa controls, the restrictions, it's had a massive impact. But yet, that was the same people that contributed to Britain's wealth from the times of slavery, our contribution to the First World War and the Second World War. But yet, when it comes to the issue about immigration, we always get discriminated. So I think there's a, there's a real contradiction there. And there has always been a debate on immigration. Um, the general election in the early 60s, uh, uh, MP in Birmingham had a slogan, basically said, um, um, vote Labour if you, um, because, they support, you know, because they support having lo lots of black people. That, the debate around immigration has happened. I grew up in Wolverhampton when Enoch Powell was a local MP. Uh, and recently, in Wolverhampton, I had a big debate whether there should be a blue plaque for Enoch Powell. And they decided, um, even though the local newspaper was social engineering this, a lot of people didn't want to have a blue plaque for Enoch Powell because his speech, Rivers of Blood, has still has impact, has influenced um, three generations of politicians across all the political parties about how they see immigration and how they see people of, um, of colour in many ways. And I think the final point is, yes, Britain, um, compared to other parts of Europe, is probably yeah, more tolerant uh, and more open, um, and etc. And But that's, that, that's not an excuse when you see high degrees of discrimination, high level... I mean, we have a government department called the Race Disparity Unit. It's there, but, and that was under probably one of Theresa May's legacies. Because across, if you look at key indicators around health and social care, housing, education, there is massive discrimination affecting people of colour. So it's not simply about us being assimilated, it's about recognising and valuing our contributions as well. We still have a degree of structural racism that's still taking place in society, and that is further reinforced around the debate around Brexit and immigration. And we, if we look hey, at thanks, the... Thanks, Patrick. I'll stop there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll give you another chance to come yeah, back sure. later on. So just in the spirit of getting lots of people in, so be selective, Madeline, but any, a brief comment on, on just one, one, maybe two things. And, Okay, to... I'll do one and a half. Uh, yeah, go so on. the half is the, the last point about what does, our, uh, what does the UK economic model need. And uh, one thing I'd just point out there is that um, these things are, uh, it's the kind of, the migration system we have and the economic model are endogenous to some extent. And so it's not that we set the economic model and then it requires a certain amount of migration, but migration influences the economic model. So if you look at the massive um, expansion, for example, in the production of soft fruits since 2004, that wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been Eastern European workers to do it. And so one of my colleagues in a, a paper wrote, essentially, employers want what they think they can get. So um, there's a kind of, it's a, um, that there's a kind of circular logic, and I think we've been thinking for a long time, you know, before the um, referendum, people would say, okay, well, maybe we need to change our economic model so that it requires less low skilled immigration. Um, it's, that didn't happen. Um, it may actually be easier to change the immigration model, and then the, the economy will adjust to some extent. Um, the, the second um, point that I wanted to make, this was the answer to the, the gentleman on the left hand side about um, how to improve the information available to decision makers in the Home Office. Uh, this is obviously a really complex issue and so I don't have, like, <laughs> I'm not going to try a comprehensive answer to it. Um, but I think two things that are, that are important, this issue of uh, user feedback, so what information comes from the applicants who experience the system themselves. Um, and then does the Home Office, um, especially <laughs> at the senior levels, have the time and the resources to care about that? And the examples, I think there are two really interesting examples at this moment. So on the one hand, we have, um, let's take family immigration system. You've got a, a, a kind of uh, 
standard processing model, family applicants put in their applications, it's a really onerous process, they have to send in reams and reams of paperwork, it's expensive, it's inconvenient, the forms are really badly designed so it's not even really clear what they're being asked in many cases. Um, and uh, I, I'm not aware of any attempt to try and understand what, how people experience this system to and speed then change up it way. on a result of it. The, yeah, the, the contrast this, dramatically different world, same department, the EU settlement scheme, suddenly we have a system that bears no relation to the previous um, schemes where there was a whole detailed process of watching people fill out the application, working out what problems they have with their experience, making it much easier for them, you know, they can do it all online, they don't have to get the same paperwork. Now why did that happen? Basically political salience, that there was, um, it was really high profile, there was a lot of scrutiny, there was an organised group of people really lobbying for, um, for an easier system for those people. And I think that the tricky thing, part of the reason that the Home Office, that the customer experience for most people going to the Home Office is not very good, is that it's just so low prof profile and it's not been a political priority to do it. Thanks very much. Okay, very brief, Alp. No, very brief. Well, we get to brief you, as we go to the left. I know, but I'll give you a chance later on. Don't worry. I accept, go on. I accept, I accept. Um, frankly, we could spend a whole session debating every one of the points already made. Can, can we separate, first of all, system? Sorry. The system that we are talking about and we need in order to control immigration. Because... Immigration, open doors, without any controls, will be disastrous for all of us, including those coming here. It's the system that we should be considering, having decided what it is that we want. Secondly, it's about attitudes as well. And I think um, Patrick was really talking about more about attitudes, more about how we, as a society, treat foreigners and uh, react to foreigners. Immigrants and immigration attitudes as opposed to the system to control the numbers coming here. There's, there's lots and lots to say. However, I think what, one thing that everyone here has already made very clear is that people have very strong views and have very definite views about immigration. Up until now, very little of that has been reflected in the way policy has evolved and the way that the politicians have reacted and come up with the sort of systems that we require. And I think that people really must have an opportunity to contribute to the sort of system that they be, believe is right for this country. Thanks, Al. Jim? I'll stick to the point raised at the back and Patrick as well uh, about the assumptions underpinning policy really and xenophobia, hate crime and so on. Um, the way it divides up really is if you look at any randomly sampled survey, I think any, I've never seen any contradiction to this, they actually show that uh, hate crime and convictions for hate crime are falling. The Home Office randomly sampled survey shows that. Uh, certainly in relation to xenophobia, the uh, EU data that's been mentioned and all sorts of other surveys show that prior to the Brexit vote, people were be becoming more positive. That's what the term that the EU survey used, positivity to immigration, becoming more positive, and that trend continued afterwards. Now, stats don't tell you everything, but there's a very big contradiction between those randomly sampled uh, data sets, and there are plenty of them, and the perception in public amongst many anti-Brexit liberals, which is precisely the... Uh, the opposite of, of that. This is important because if we start off a debate about migration, assuming that the British public are xenophobic, that there is a tide of hate crime and all of these, all this other hyperbole, then we're not frankly going to get very far, no matter which side of the fence uh, we sit on. And just very quickly, in addition to this, I think the Windrush thing is really interesting in this respect. In fact, again, polling is polling. I'm not saying it's everything. But 80% of people supported the Windrush. I think it was 81% of people in a survey said they completely supported the Windrush uh, of victims. Why? Generally because they saw them as de facto citizens. They lived with them, they lived next door to them, they interacted with them, they worked with them. 80% of people did say that uh, migrants coming to this country should be subject to um, initially checks so they can acquire a certain status and move towards uh, citizenship. 80% of people thought that. 
Danny Dawling in his book, which is much lauded by opponents of Brexit, uh, used the latter statistic, 80% of people thought there should be formal requirements to require citizenship, to basically say the public are unsympathetic with Windrush, whereas in fact the truth, the statistic was never mentioned, was the 80% who support. And that's just very, very typical, I think, over the last three and a half years of the way this issue has been reported. And I don't think we're going to get far until we begin to question some of those base assumptions about the people who matter, the voters in, in, in the UK. OK, thanks. OK, so then there's a lady on, in the, le the middle on the left here. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm going to go to the gentleman uh, in, in the middle over here that's been signalling for a while. So, so what's a fair immigration system? Um, well, I voted Brexit and I'm in favour of the most possible liberal system because I think that um, immigration is a good thing. Uh, but, you know, supposedly we had free movement under the EU, but actually uh, we, we, we didn't have free movement. We, we may have had some free movement for a limited number of white Europeans. But when I talk to black and Asian people on the streets, um, uh, it's clear that those people, as has been described, are discriminated against under EU rules in this system that we're under now. Whatever they did in the war, um, if, if they're from former Commonwealth countries, they're right at the back of the queue, and that is obviously unfair and discriminatory. Um, so, uh, but on the other hand, my, I, I'm not in favour of open borders. I think that that is... Um, you know, that, that, that might appear attractive, but it, it, it's also a trap because the problem with open borders is that if we have no distinction between X and Y or here and there, then we're talking about some kind of super state. And the problem with super states is that they are not, uh, they're not uh, sensitive to public pressure. They're not accountable to people. And in the end, they're going to do what they want. Um, and the whole, the whole point about Brexit was that we want power to come back here to the people. Because one M MEP representing 600,000 people, you know, that, that's not democracy. That's, that's bureaucracy. OK, thanks. So there was the gentleman in the middle over here. He's now, yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, pun, punchy now, folks, yeah, well, give everyone it's, a it's chance. It's just really quick, and I think it's been uh, covered, but um, Frank yesterday mentioned uh, in the uh, borders debate about um, the needs of the communities uh, to which uh, immigrants are received to be taken into account, and I was wondering if, if, if you agree with that. Very good. Okay, there's a lady down here with the glasses. I didn't hear. Yeah. Right. Two actual quick questions. First of all, the role of the common agricultural policy in fueling migration because of its tariffs against sub-Saharan Africa and actually leading to poverty in sub-Saharan Africa and, and fueling all the poor people coming across the Mediterranean. I'd like people's views on that. Secondly, the role of identity cards. Do we, if we're going to stop actual people trafficking and stop people being trafficked into nail bars, do we need um, identity cards and some kind of entitlement card to welfare benefits to manage that? OK, the gentleman in front. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Well, actually, I also wanted to ask about the link between immigration and welfare. And I'm very much open border. Uh, I'm also thinking about not, uh, not only the uh, the national um, um, the public discourse for the sake of nationals, but also of, of global public discourse, and these freedoms would be welcome. On the other hand, also for, from inside, myself as an entrepreneur would like to bring maybe employees, I might bring my parents or uh, lovers or spouses, all of this is incredibly difficult, if not impossible. Uh, but I, at the same time, and that's complementary, I'm actually quite a skeptic about welfare systems, and this was why we had the a referendum on this in, in the first place. Uh, by the way, I'm pro-Brexit as well, but, but I wonder, wonder whether the whether the panel sees a strong link, and I do think in terms of the impossibility of open borders, that has to do with the welfare system. And that just what uh, that remark was made. So I just also wanted to just ask Patrick Quickly. something, yeah. just very briefly, in terms of homophobia and sexism. Uh, I couldn't quite understand how, where this lies in the, in the current immigration uh, policies. Okay, and there's a lady down the front here. Can I see any other hands now? Okay. 
there's a respect in which um, any immigration controls, and in particular internal controls, are discriminatory and foster discrimination. So I think one of the first things we should be asking for, and I think Patrick talked about it, is an end to hostile environment measures, because they spread out discrimination um, far and away from um, the particular group that it's supposed to be directed at, which is illegal migrants. The second thing, and really I want to ask, is why people think um, that labour migration is a good thing. Labour migration, effectively, you're saying to a person, you get educated in your other country, they pay for everything that's done for you, you come here on a limited visa with limited rights, and then when you've done your work, at the end of your visa, you're expected to go again. And that's discriminatory as well, because that person is then prevented from participating in our life, forever aspiring to become uh, a citizen or settled here, um, and uh, that enforces discrimination. You could say, why bring people from the Ukraine to pick apples in Kent, when there's plenty of migrants who are already in this country, been here for ages, who, because they haven't got any legal right to be here, they're not allowed to work. Well, there's some people who could become integrated, who, who could work and gradually work their way up and belong here instead of bringing in new people on limited um, and very restricted visas who could never join in. Thank you very much. Never become part of this society. Okay, just one last one, the gentleman there, yep, yeah, in the middle. And then just to warn you, the gentleman behind, we wanted you just to repeat that question because we didn't quite catch it. So, yeah, just in an instant. But, yeah, please. Thanks. Um, so a view that I've heard expressed a few times here, I've heard it other times as well in other events, is I supported Brexit, but I really support a liberal immigration system. You know, you, you hear this quite a lot amongst, um, like, Brexit supporting elites, I suppose, or people who are a bit more you know, metropolitan, liberal, middle class, whatever, you know, it's this kind of position, it's more high status. Um, if actually, let's say Boris Johnson instituted an immigration system that was more liberal and increased net migration and basically listened to, you know, the CBI and gave the employers their cheap labor, um, what would the political ramifications of that be? I mean, would we see a new insurgency of populism or are people going to just keel over? I mean, it, it seems to me like there's a real tension there and unless it's actually resolved, <laughs> this yeah. issue is going to continue forever. Great question. Okay, if you could just, yeah, just clarify your question yeah. uh, really uh, quick. <laughs> okay, um, do you think the needs of the individual, the needs of the communities in which immigrants um, would be settled need to be taken into account? Good. Okay. What's happening with the with the home communities, the the, the Dagenhams of the world? That kind of question. So, um, closing comments, uh, starting with you, Patrick. Okay. Um, obviously, it's been a, a very rich debate. So, just to pick up on a couple of things. I heard the word quite a few times, making the making a link between immigration and welfare. Can I'd like to clarify that when most people come to this country, they're not coming here to get to sign on and get benefit. They're coming here to have a better life, to work, and more importantly, to have remittances, to send money back to their families wherever they've come from. And this is very important because there's a clear, I mean, the economic, but if, if, just imagine if, you, if all migrants stop tours in London for the day, the whole country would come to a ground, a ground still. Nothing would happen here because of the relationship between the economy and migration and technology and thinking. That's, I think that's the first thing. Secondly, um, people feel that um, the public's been restricted not having a debate about immigration. But for the last 10 general elections, we've always talked about immigration. Immigration has always been up there. And one of the interesting things, you're quite right about the whole stuff around the Wundrus scandal. I was heavily involved in the campaign around the Wundrus generation, and I did my petition on the UK government website, and nearly 200,000 people signed my petition. And if you look at the heat map, which is still on the government website, people from the Isle of Wight all the way down to, up to, um, uh, up to Scotland supported the campaign, and millions of people supported the campaign because they saw the winners' generation as inverted commas good migrants. 
And we have to be very careful about what is a good migrant and what is a bad migrant. And that is a language that is used all the time by the likes of Tom Robertson and the Brexit Party and elements of the Conservative Party as well. OK, we've just got to wind it off, Patrick, so that's, that's okay. fine. All right, thank you very much, Madeline. Thanks. Um, so I'm just going to answer one point about um, the question about development. Um, I'm not going to claim to know anything about the common agricultural policy and what the impacts of that have actually been in Africa. Um, but I, there is a lot of research that's been done about the relationship between migration and development. And it's actually quite interesting because um, what it suggests is that um, development is not necessarily a good way to, um, to reduce immigration. A lot of people see this as say, well, they wouldn't need to come here if they were richer. In some cases, that, the reason that relationship doesn't work is that it's actually not the very poorest who move. So that a lot of the development debate is about, um, say, the bottom 20% of, of the global population. Those people are mostly are too poor to move, certainly to Europe, um, if they're displaced, uh, often, they, often they're displaced internally or to neighboring countries. And actually, it's when people get a little bit richer, when they enter the middle classes, that they have the resources that it takes either, say, to go become an international student or a worker in another country, or to pay to be smuggled across the border illegally, which is something that's actually quite expensive. Um, so obviously development is something that's valuable in its, its own right, um, but it's not necessarily um, a solution to the demand of people to move. Thanks very much. Al? As a Windrusher, I came in 1956, my father came in 1950. Um, I, I became a, a part of this country. I'm a proud Brit. I very proudly represented this country overseas. My experience working overseas that this country is second to none for its acceptance and tolerance. I just will not accept that as a nation we are racist. We are not. This issue is not about race in any case. It's about the levels of immigration. It's about the sort of people who come here. It's about controlling them in the interests, first and foremost, of, on the, of those who are already here. The needs of the communities, of course we must take those into account. Of course we must think about what the impact is, particularly when large-scale, speedy immigration takes place into particular areas. That is an absolute must. What we need to do is do what 30 million people in this country want and have sensible levels of immigration. Not no to immigration, for goodness sake. Of course immigration is a good thing, but it's got to be the proper immigration, good immigration in the interests of those who are here already and those who are going to come, and it's going to happen at a pace where we can keep up with the needs of our communities. As things are at the moment, the last thing we are able to do is provide for the needs of our population. It's growing far too quickly and largely because of the out of control immigration. Okay, thanks, Jim. I think there's a, a kind of pessimistic and declinist narrative on both sides of this debate, frankly. On the one hand, um, racism across the board uh, is one assumption. On the other side, uh, people who argue generally for more open borders do so on the basis of our economy's needs, our needs, and cheap labour, whatever that happens to be. And effectively what both sides of that debate are tending towards is treating people as means to ends rather than ends in themselves. And I really agree with kind of Patrick's sentiments, I think, on this with regard to the Windrush. Because I think the Windrush showed people being treated as things, units, means to ends, rather than people, individuals, uh, with, with lives and relationships in themselves. I do support the right of hundreds of thousands of Romanians to come to this country and work in car washes, low paid employment and so on. But let's not hold this up as some kind of amazing, fantastic uh, liberal gain. In fact, people are leaving their role as citizens within a country to come here with very little other than the capacity to work and maybe send a little bit of, of, of money home. They are also being treated as means to ends. Uh, now, very, very finally, in relation to Brexit, I think one of the reasons, uh, sort of broad reasons, why many people voted Brexit was because they themselves felt, in the context of Britain and supposedly British citizens, they felt themselves that they were means to ends 
not really in control in any meaningful sense of the policies uh, that shape their lives. There's something pretty concrete that the majority of British people actually have in common with the migrants and potential migrants, asylum seekers and, everybody, and everyone else. So I think that should be pointed out. Democracy is prior to policy. Brexit was about democracy. And therefore, I think that we have to resolve that crisis almost as a precondition for establishing a, a more humane and liberal approach to migration. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Can we thank the panel?